let's uh, just start by asking you, Representative, to uh, tell us your district, your party affiliation, describe the geography of the district for people watching us online, and then brief bio and, and why you're running, and then we'll have the same question for you, but you don't have to tell us the district. Yeah, it's already done that. You may have to cue me because there okay. was a lot in there. Yeah, but, yeah okay. Uh, All right. Please, uh, please begin. Mark Gamba, House District 41, which is uh, Milwaukee, Oak Grove, Selwood, Eastmoreland, Westmoreland, uh, up in almost to the, the Ross Island Bridge. Okay. And um, you are a member of which party? Democrat and Working Families. Okay. And uh, tell us just a brief bio. Uh, I was a commercial and editorial photographer for all of my career, um, well, since, since my late 20s, uh, and shot for clients like National Geographic and big advertising company, Adidas, Carhartt, Jeep. Um, I've been, I was on the Milwaukee City Council for 10 years, two and a half as a counselor and seven and a half as mayor. Uh, I was on the planning commission before that for about three years. And then before that, I helped start uh, the art committee in Milwaukee Art Mob, which they changed back to the art committee recently. And uh, since you've been in the legislature, you've served how many terms? One term. One term. And which committees do you sit on? I am the vice chair of housing and homelessness. I sit on uh, ag land use natural resources and water. Uh, I sit on climate, energy, and environment, and I sit on the uh, subcommittee, how, the Ways and Means Subcommittee for Economic Development and Transportation. Okay. Um, great. Uh, and now that you have uh, had uh, one term to decide whether you like it, why do you want the seat back? <laughs> <laughs> Not because I like it. <laughs> okay. uh, because I have a lot of work still to do. I mean, I, I, I ran uh, with some very uh, specific intentions around getting this state up to speed on addressing climate, um, addressing homelessness, and poverty in general. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think we've got other issues that are that climate is driving. Uh, we're going to probably have to look pretty hard at water and the way we uh, control that water law. Okay, great. Elvis, um, my background is I uh, tell you tell us your name first. Oh, Elvis Clark. Okay, <laughs> and I grew up in Tigard, Oregon. Uh, when it was a small city before uh, Highway 217 went in, actually, it took our farm out. And um, I went to school and uh, graduated from Portland State University with a master's in uh, economics. I then went to work for Bonneville Power Administration during a time when electricity demand was skyrocketing and they were considering building five nuclear plants. but. And so they hired a bunch of economists like me to figure out whether we really needed to pull the trigger on that or not. So I worked there for 25 years and looking at uh, cost of generating resources and um, their inputs and stuff like that. Then I went to work afterwards for the uh, Oregon Public Utility Commission for a couple of years and uh, uh, over reviewed uh, rate cases and uh, made testimony and stuff like that. What, when did you work for the PUC? Uh, from 2008 to 2010. Okay. What did you do after that? I've been uh, doing uh, like um, community stuff in Milwaukee. Like I, uh, I'm on the Public Safety Advisory Committee and the transportation stuff we get to uh, be a part of. and. I make recommendations to the city council. Mm -hmm. So you guys, have you overlapped with Representative Gamba? Oh yes, and yeah. Uh, For um, years. Yeah, yeah. We, we've kind of gone back and forth sometimes. Okay, okay. and, and we, you didn't say, but just so people who are watching know this, you're the Republican nominee for this I'm the seat. Republican nominee. So um, you know your opponent 
pretty well. Um, oh yeah. Why are you Why are you running against him? What have you seen in his record or or in his positions that make you think you would be a better representative for the district? Well, um, Oregon is kind of really lagging in individual economic well-being. If you look at uh, economic data from the federal government Bureau of Economic Analysis, Oregon is like in the bottom 10 of U.S. states for af real after-tax income. And a lot of that does has to do with we're, we have one of the higher costs of living of the states and we also ha are, have above average taxes and we don't have uh, real stellar incomes, they're not bad, but yeah. by the time you take account of the cost of living yeah. and taxes, you are in the bottom 10 of states. So what do, you, what, what do you think, what are some specific policies the legislature could look at in order to lower the cost of living or increase per capita? Yeah, this gets us into the rub about climate and how fast we go to uh, cleaner fuels. Uh -huh. Because right now we're seeing utility bills and the rates go up sharply and part of, a large part of the reason is the adoption of net zero mandates. And uh, I looked at the PG rate proposal that's currently in place. The utility batteries are a big chunk of that rate increase and they're really expensive compared to just having a standby uh, gas generator, diesel generator. They were both, the costs are in both in there. The capital costs are like 10 times for some of the batteries mm -hmm. than if you just built or kept your um, existing generators for backup to the, when we have these climate emergencies. Do, do you think that, given that you have uh, looked at rate cases in the past for the PUC, do you think that the utilities are gold plating assets, in other words, that they are trying to bring into rates uh, certain high-priced assets essentially take advantage of this move to zero? Yes, because I do, because the utilities are guaranteed almost a rate right. of return right. on capital. Yeah. They're not, yeah, they don't make anything out the fuel. Right. So capital is what they are interested in, so they've gone along with it, although I'm not totally sure it's, you know, they might have some qualms about the reliability side of it because it, there is flags that are appearing in some of the uh, um, the uh, main uh, utility bodies that oversee conservation and power and um, planning of the resources for the region. They are flagging that we have an increasing risk during uh, cold weather and hot right, weather. Right, the inter inter intermit intermittency. Right. Which are very awkward. And we are seeing reli <coughs> uh, reliability issues, issues yeah. in California now. So, so we, we don't, I don't, I, we could talk about that all day. <laughs> I'm sure Representative Gamble would like to, to chime in. Yeah. Before we, we, so, so one area in which you would look to change this. Uh, right. Is, is energy, uh, is the move toward uh, zero carbon. Is there anything else that you would point to that the legislature could do? For instance, one of the reasons uh, that we have a low standard of living is our high cost of housing. So oh, yeah. is, the, is there something right. the legislature could do to address the high cost of housing in this state? Yes, I think right now we've had a lot of population growth in this since the land use laws went into effect. So the, the housing demand is concentrated back into the urban areas and I think if we spread out demand to the outer edges of our metro area we could uh, maybe take some of the bidding war away that happens. So, so, so to increase the size of the UGBs or relax land use laws? Yeah, like bring in a, more housing on the outskirts to relieve and um, there's some drawbacks to try, I mean you're talking about farmland and so yeah. but if you move people out a little bit, they also have the opportunity to maybe grow their own fr fruits and yeah. vegetables too. So there's some bonuses there. Yeah. Um, okay. But that's the one of the things on housing. Okay. Yeah. I, I saw you shaking your head. I'd love to. I know you spend a lot of time on cream, green, cream, 
Green energy. I'm trying to tell you. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. So please uh, follow up with what your opponent said. Um, well, there's a number of things. First of all, the recent uh, rate increases from PGE had absolutely nothing to do with our transition to green energy. They're spinning it that it did. It had to do with hardening the system because of climate change. It had to do with uh, the cost that they've incurred repairing massive repairs after the ice storms, two major ice storms that we've had in the region that shut down whole regions for weeks on end. And continuing to recognize that we have these disasters that are causing us great expense and then saying the solution to that is to not fix the initial problem that's causing us the disasters in the first place. That's a, that's a penny wise pound foolish concept. Besides that, green energy is right now the cheapest energy there is. Can I, can I slow you down for one second? Yeah. So do you think that, are you hearing yourself from the investor on the utilities, them blaming the climate policies the legislature has passed for these rate increases? I don't think the investor-owned utilities are publicly saying that, no. There is, there are efforts uh, that we're seeing quietly to spread that rumor yeah. that the whole reason your rates went up is because of green energy. How, and how, they're very, very effective, so I have to assume there's some money behind how, this. How, how, where, where are you, seeing, just curious where you're seeing that? Just all over the place. Okay. In any conversation you have, okay. you ask people about the rate increases and that's mm -hmm. one of the first things they'll say. They're, the legislature made me do it? Yeah. Okay. So, um, and, and the honest truth is, none of our IOUs are going to hit their climate targets, the HB 2021 climate targets. Period. Full stop. So you you were not in the building when when that bill passed. Some some people ha who have passed through this room this cycle have said that the clean to coal bill, which is HB 2021, didn't really uh, include enough teeth to incentivize or force, depending on which verb you want to use, the utilities to make that transition. So what what, what do you know about? I that? agree. It, it's uh, it's relatively toothless. Um, a, B, it only included a certain sector of the energy market, right? It only included the IOUs. So it didn't include any of the COUs, it didn't include natural gas. So we were only going after a very small part of the market and the, it, it's toothless. Um, the most recent filing from uh, PAC makes it very clear that they're not, have, don't have any intention to, to meet their targets. Is, is that their newest rate case or where are you seeing that? That was the, uh, oh man, you know how much stuff I read? Yeah, yeah. Um, I cannot remember exactly Okay, but, but they said that in writing somewhere that you've read it. Okay. Yeah. Have they said it in a way that you would consider defiant, like, hey, yeah. you can't make us, or no, it's no. not it's possible? No, it's just, no, it's just the way that the, I think it was the IRP, but don't hold me to that, yeah. um, was laid out. It was clear they weren't. Try, going to try and hit the okay. targets. Okay, so one of the one of the what appears to be the uh, major issues that you all, whoever, whichever of you is elected, will tackle next year is the transportation funding package. ODOT has been going around the state telling people they're broke. Um, w one of the interesting conflicts to us, I think, is that ODOT wants more money. With that money, they want to build more highway nice. capacity. Uh, and improve, of course, existing capacity that's old, it's directly in conflict with our climate policies. So I'd like to hear how you're thinking about th that conflict. Well, so let's start with from the, from the basic. I sit on the Economic Development and Transportation Ways and Means Sub. So I heard their report two years ago where they pointed out that given the status quo, if we change nothing this year, they are going to have to cut back on just general maintenance mm -hmm. by I think, I think it was 11 percent or 12 percent or something yeah. Yeah. Uh, each year yeah. and there were bridges in this state that they probably would not touch for 200 years okay no bridge out there is designed to last 200 years without maintenance uh -huh. so that should be a wake-up call for everyone that uh -huh. ODOT doesn't is not being sufficiently funded and it's not surprising we we knew back in 2017, um, I was not obviously in the house at that point, but I was paying attention because I was a mayor and I was, you know, on JPAC, I was definitely involved in transportation. Um, not on JPAC, I was a, the uh, alternate, sorry. Um, but I sat through all the meetings. Yeah. It feels like being on JPAC. 
um, that at that time, in 2017, in order to just get back to standard operating procedure, we needed to raise gas tax about 50 cents. And due to political, uh, whatever, Cow imagination or, yes, your word, not mine. <laughs> um, yeah, lack of intestinal fortitude, my father yeah. would call it. Um, they raised it a dime. Yeah. And because of inflation, we were already behind in 2017. Because of inflation, we're getting further and further and further behind with the gas tax. People like to say, oh, it's all the EVs and the hybrids are using less gas. That's like 10, 15% of the decrease in the value of the yeah. highway fund. It is predominantly inflation and the fact that we never tied the gas tax to inflation. Yeah. It should have been indexed yeah. the day it was passed, yeah. but they, they yeah. never did that. And they tend to not want to do that. I gave a speech on the floor last year, and I, it was a different agency saying, we need to just tie this to, index this to inflation, because we're going to keep having yeah. to come back here. Yeah. And every time we fail to pass this, that agency is going to get worse and worse and worse. Okay. Um, so you're an economist. Yes. Um, so, well, I looked at the uh, ODOT uh, budget for 25-27. Yeah. Um, um, let's see. Um, I would. Uh, there's going to also looked at the revenue forecast for the next uh, for what the current uh, biennium. And it's pretty uh, lush with new monies coming yeah. in. Yeah. So I think we could swing some of the general fund money from there to the uh, uh, the operation and maintenance part of the shortage because that's basic stuff. You got to fund that, and so that would be a higher priority for me to transfer some of that money to operate. So historically, uh, historically we haven't done that. I mean, I think we put some money from the general fund to the uh, to the interstate bridge replacement last billion dollars last session, first time, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, an interstate bridge, yes. Uh, so, but I mean, I guess the policy question is, is it a good idea to take money from the general fund and uh, spend it on transportation when transportation historically has had its own funding stream? Uh, well, given our current situation, like I said, where we're going in after tax income is not good. Yeah. So I'm wanting to use surpluses for basic stuff yeah. like operation and yeah. maintenance, so I would do it. And uh, as to indexing, yeah, I think that should be come in uh, too. You it, need more so money. You're so indexing. Okay. I, I, I'm yeah. okay with indexing okay. too. Okay. Also, I think on the clean fuels program, yep. there's some bike and ped stuff in the budget of ODOT that could be maybe eligible or made qualifying for renewable credit part of that program. And that might bring in some more money over the, oh, for ODOT in that bike and ped stuff. Okay. Um, Representative, you uh, have a reputation of being one of the most progressive members of your caucus. Would you agree with that? Uh, yeah, probably. So we are always interested in independence or somebody who doesn't, you know, just follow a particular ideology. Can you give us an example of where you've either said no to a powerful democratic <laughs> interest or where you have gone, gone your own way on an issue that is not, you know, where, where you I don't know, par partnered with a Republican on a bill or, or taken a position that isn't a doctrinaire progressive position? Well, I've definitely partnered with Republicans on a number of things. Um, and I think there's a lot of opportunity to that. When you get level-headed people sitting down together to talk about real-world problems, very often you can yep. start to figure out solutions. So, and I, I, would, I would not say that that's me getting sideways with my party because I find most of the folks in the legislature, most of the Democrats, are interested in doing that and are working towards that. You see Helen promoting uh, Owens, Owens on water, as a yeah. co-chair. Yeah. The, so there's a, there's a lot of work and Owens is actually on the um, uh, Environmental Caucus now. But the, the places that I've famously gotten sideways with my um, party were on 4002. Uh, I opposed that for a very particular reason. First of all, I think the war on drugs has been an abject failure. Um, 
particularly for black and brown people. So going backwards on that was disappointing. I understood the concern. I also understood the fact that we were possibly facing a ballot measure that would be well funded. So I understood why m most of my party went there. And I was prepared to work with them on that, but I did have a couple of caveats. One was supersiding of uh, drug facilities, drug uh, rehab facilities. Mm -hmm. When, before we passed 4002, we already had waiting lists for rehab in this state. Pretty significant waiting lists, mm -hmm. all right? And now we're setting up a program where we're forcing people, more or less, to at least take a run at rehab. Mm -hmm. Where? Where are we gonna do that? So I, I, I don't know the specifics of the bill. It included supersiding or it, it did, did not? not. Okay. It, it was initially in there because I yeah. demanded it and then yeah. the Republicans demanded that it come out yeah. And I worked to pass it as a standalone bill and got this close. We were yeah. signing die. We were on the cuts. Would, would that bill have been for uh, only rehab facilities? Because part of what yeah. we've been talking about internally is uh, secure residential treatment facilities for people with mental severe yeah. mental illness. And I think that's been an issue in Milwaukee. It, in, it in was. Um, three, t I think it's three times yeah. Uh, yeah. when I was either on the planning commission or on the council. We've had facilities come to the Planning Commission. Of course, they're, they're never outright allowed, right, uh, on yeah. any, in any zone. Um, and so it's a hearing at the Planning Commission, and of course the neighbors come out, pitchforks and torches. It's gonna be horrible, it's gonna be horrible. And so then it ends up in the, pot, in the hands of the council very yeah. often. All three times I supported those facilities going in, and all three times they did eventually go in. Here's what I'll tell you. When I go knock on the doors of some of those same mm -hmm. folks that were out, pitchforks and torches, you know what they'll say today? Get the homeless Best people neighbors we got. Oh, oh well, Best neighbors okay. we have. Okay. We love them. So why did your uh, colleagues not support a super saying bill? Because uh, Leader Helfrich was adamantly opposed to it, um, and they needed his help to get 4,002 okay. passed. Well, he, he'll be here this afternoon. We'll get a chance to talk to him. About it. <laughs> you should ask him. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, but I do agree that not just mental health, or not just drug addiction treatment, but also mental health, because we're in this. We we rank last yeah. in mental health care. Yeah. Right. That's one of the many things that comes out of the general fund. I yeah. might add, yeah. and that's why we rank last is because we underfund it. Period. Yeah. Full yeah. stop. Yeah. Part of the issue is you have to, you can do facilities no bigger than 16 beds. Yeah. Mm. That's expensive, yeah. right? That means you need lots of facilities with lots of people yeah. doing the basic work. Yeah. We can't just build another big giant hospital like we had yeah. down in Diamond Salem. Yeah. That's not allowed anymore. So that's going to be more expensive and it's going to mean they're in more communities. Now that's good in a way because that means their families can come visit them yeah. more easily, things like that. It's bad in that it's A, it's more expensive to do, B, it requires being in lots of communities. So every single time one of those things comes in, you're gonna have neighbors, pitchforks and torches, pushing back. Okay. And a lot of councils won't be yep. willing to stand up. Yep. If you're able to win this seat, what's the first bill or concept that you would want to bring uh, for your colleagues to consider? What's your highest priority? Some moderate or giving the uh, Public Utility Commission more uh, latitude in uh, slowing if they're seeing uh, rate increases from the transition to net zero. If they're seeing that the proposals coming in, like the current PG proposal, are um, uh, causing this rate surge to happen and people get disconnected, then they can have some latitude to uh, moderate the pace. Now also they have, uh, they do have some ability to moderate the pace already, I think for reliability. Yeah. Yeah. So Not just for reliability, actually for price too. That's in HB 2021. That's one of the many toothless parts of the bill. Okay. Oh, okay. Well, that's fine. <laughs> what, 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 what would you, if you're reelected, what would you bring as your first priority next time? Well, we have 33 bills that we've already pre-session filed. What's, uh, what, what's what's your favorite of those? By we, you mean your office? My or, staff. Okay, I was going to say, like, a bit, a bit, a bit. Yeah. yeah, my staff, my office. 
Um, probably, pick your favorite child, but um, I would say that the most critical to most Oregonians is the package of four bills that we have uh, addressing transmission. So right now, we have the situation where we're looking at a 30% increase in load, electrical load, over the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. our, transmission our transmission system is basically at capacity. It mm -hmm. can't carry significantly mm -hmm. more load. The one transmission line that is under development as of today began the process in 2007, mm -hmm. if we're very lucky, they might start construction next year. Talking about the board, is it? Boardman Hemingway. Yeah. So that's a 20 year process to build one new yeah. <laughs> transmission line. And I just told you that part where within 10 years, we're gonna see a 30% load growth. So, so a lot of that load growth appears to be coming <coughs> from these data, data farms. Um, I'm wondering to what degree Oregon needs to like look at that from a policy perspective could, because it could appear to the untrained eye that people in Silicon Valley or in other centers are looking around the country and saying where can we put data centers without much difficulty and where we can access a lot of water and cheap power, cheap-ish power. Mm -hmm. Cheap and green power. They're, and, and they're all very interested in So why are we, I mean, we're like the Saudi Arabia for Silicon Valley <laughs> in, in a way. We're, we're providing a cheap resource to people who don't live here. I know it feels that way. Um, if you, I've been to several conferences this last summer and this is a topic of conversation in every single state. Okay. So, it well, takes a lot of data centers okay. for you to be able to see the cat videos on <laughs> TikTok or whatever. You know, there and then AI is magnifying that tenfold. Yeah. So you don't think that's a that? And I again, I speak from near total ignorance on that. So you don't think that's an issue? Oregon's not being singled out. I don't think so. Yeah. Not not according to the my fellow legislators from other states. We're, uh -huh. we're seeing it across the country. Now, there are places where there's a little, a little heavier and a little lighter, yeah. and that tends to be, they do like places where water is more available, but there's a lot going up in Arizona. Yeah. That's a place that's a, you know knocking on the door of running sure. out of water tomorrow. Um, but by they, the way, they the also want green energy. Every single one of them has made green pledges, and they're pretty serious about it. They're, yeah. So Amazon Web Services is part of our transmission work group. We've got a 48-ish member work group. All the utilities, Bonneville, everyone you can imagine that should be involved in thinking about transmission is sitting on it. And they are very interested in getting green energy. That is, that is yeah. part of why they're interested in getting transmission across the mountains. Should we still be incentivizing the development of those data centers with with the, all the rural tax credits and enterprise zones? No. Is that going to come up this session? It came up last session. In I think. In which committee, or was that a Ways and Means issue? Or? Uh, Nathanson was involved, so it might okay. have been revenue or. Okay. I don't know. I, I'll, I'll look back at it. I'm yeah. just kind of interested because it's like, what, why are we giving? When there were none. You know, it makes sense, but yeah. now that it's happening by, you know, it's, it's a I, conveyor, I, it's a conveyor belt. I've never been a giant fan of the kinds of those kinds of tax credits. I, yep. um, you know, I've seen enough reports that yep. say that's not going to affect one way or the other. Right. Whether there's no jobs either. So what was yeah, the yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, all right, we're running out of time here. I'd like uh, each of you to just give us uh, 30 seconds on why you're the best, anything you haven't said about why you're the uh, best person for this job, and, and uh, we'll start with you, Elvis. Okay, um, I uh, am the best candidate because I am really concentrated on the individual and the, uh, their economic well-being, and trying to promote the individual to have more economic well-being will uh, help them uh, feel better about themselves and also uh, less reliance on the government so that they feel more uh, less vulnerable to government change in policy. That's the reasons I'm really running. Okay. Representative? Good, good reasons to run. Um, I, I wouldn't disagree with most of what he just said. I think uh, we've allowed our society to, we have unfettered capitalism and very fettered uh, pay for the working class. So you see 
each year rents are going up 8, 10, 14 percent and you're seeing people's incomes going up 1, 2, maybe 3 percent at best. Even if you are a very conscientious person when you rented your apartment and you're making $3,000 a month, so you go, I can afford a $1,000 a month apartment and you rent that apartment and you pay your rent every single month and the next year it goes up 10 percent and you got a 2 percent increase and the year after that it goes up 14 percent and you got a 3 percent increase. You can see yep. where that's going. Mm -hmm. Pretty darn quickly you're paying 50 percent of your income for rent. And what that means is eventually you are going to be evicted. And this is why we have 2,000 working families every month being evicted in the state of Oregon. 2,000. Wow. So we have to fix one end or the other of that equation. We've taken a run at rent control twice. We have a very anemic rent control system. I strongly believe we need to take a run at the other end. We need to tie the cost of housing to the minimum wage. So we have a bill that we'll be bringing this session. I brought it last session, you can look it up. It hasn't changed much. Or not last session, but last long session. Um, the difference is this time we're bringing an organization, a lot of people supporting it. So walk me through a little of the, of the logistics of that. It's an interesting idea. Uh, what would the minimum wage be under those circumstances? So it would be based on the average one bedroom apartment in a given region. The what's a given region is part of what we're still trying to work out. There's a lot of different, we could use HUD fair market uh, regions, we could use the current regions for a minimum wage. There's a lot of different ways that we could approach that and we're still working on that piece. Uh, but basically it would say that minimum wage has to earn you enough to make three times what the average one bedroom apartment is. So it depends on which region you're talking about. There are places in the state where it's barely gonna go up. You might see it go up a buck, right? That gets you to the average afford, being able to afford the average one bedroom apartment. There are places in the state where it's gonna go up a lot. It's gonna double. It doesn't do it instantly. It does it by $2 an hour a year until we hit that. What we believe is not only the obvious, if you're working a full-time job, you'll be able to afford a place to live. That's pretty straightforward. We also believe it's going to cause renewed investment in housing, particularly workforce housing. And you filed a bill concept on this? Yes. Can you send that to us? Uh, I can send you what we filed, and I can also send you the bill from the session two years ago. Great, thank you. Yeah. Email me and remind me, because by the time I ride home, I will have forgotten. Okay. All right, last question for both of you. It's the question we're asking every candidate this session at the end of these, which is what were you best known for in high school? High school? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I didn't, do, I didn't have a big uh, following in high school. <laughs> <laughs> I just, uh, well, what, what did you spend, what did you concentrate on or spend all your time? Oh, I studied uh, economics as early as high school. and. My uh, social study teacher was actually former Senator uh, Rod Monroe. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Cool. Interesting. Yeah, and so I got to read about the Great Depression, and, uh, and that kind of proved my interest in the whole topic. And that, from there, it was career. Wow. Okay. Great. Um, representative? Probably. I was the um, only photographer for our high school, so I shot all the pictures for the yearbook and the school paper. I was also the photo editor of the yearbook. Um, so I was constantly, you know, I had a camera over my shoulder with a big Mecha Blitz flash on it. And uh, I ended up with the nickname Flash because <laughs> of the flash, not because I was fast at track. Okay. Where did you go to high school? Glenwood Springs High School. Where's that? Colorado, Western Colorado. So you and Halford? Colorado yeah. boys. Colorado yeah, Colorado. and we've actually had conversations about, you know, we both look at the revenue mess that Oregon's in, uh -huh. and we just shake our heads and go, God, we need a sales tax. Uh-huh. Interesting. All right. Well, thank you both for coming in. Oh, yeah. yeah thank you. Appreciate your time.